So as soon as I stopped laughing, we could kick off the June meeting of the Scarlet Quill Society. Uh, Christine got me going like five seconds before we had to start recording. And so um, I'm just going to like try to put my face back on, drink a little lemonade. I'm yeah, trying to make fetch happen here or summer happen. It is one of my friends refers to these as like days where the sky fails to load correctly. Um, sitting here in an atmospheric river in the Pacific Northwest on the lands of the Multnomah, the Wasco, the Cowlitz, Keplamet, Clackamas, the Bands of Chinook, the Tuolumne. And this is, a, you know, historically, this is a confluence of nations um, coming together on the banks of the Chihuahua and in the shadow of Y East. And I am very lucky to be here, but also conscious that the fact that I'm here means that someone else isn't, that historically should be. So I want to, we really, yeah, right, want to acknowledge that and to acknowledge that this is unceded land. Um, and it's paying us back by not giving us a summer, honestly. Um, the garden is not growing outside. My tomatoes have their first leaves on them. The cabbage has its first leaf. The broccoli had like one flower and bolt immediately. The broccoli is literally, it's four feet tall. Um, broccoli flowers, they're really pretty. Um, and that brings us to what we're talking about this month, which is weeds um, and weeds in your writing. And for the first time this year, now that we're halfway through the year, um, we're actually turning to line editing. We're getting away from developmental editing. We're getting away from the ideas that like you should notice the big things. These are things that are supposed to, you know, did, did you put a gun in the first act? Are you firing it in the second act? Um, do you have a plot hole that you could drive a truck through? Should this guy have always been on the pirate ship? Um, is the connection between these characters believable? All of these sort of big picture things. And this month we're starting to kind of narrow it down. And at this point, if you are an editor, you are looking at a completed story. Um, and it's a completed story that's been through at least sort of one round, hopefully, of developmental edits where people have looked at it and said, this order makes no sense. Um, I don't know why this character is here. I don't know why you are doing it this way. Uh, these kinds of trees don't grow here. This is not what this land looks like. Um, have you ever met a five-year-old? Although really nitty gritty character stuff like that, we're going to be doing later in the year. Let me, let me scroll through and, and see if I can figure out which, uh, August, August will be all about characters, um, which is great because it's my spouse's birthday and my spouse is a character. Um, <laughs> so and actually next month, I'm really, really excited about it. the dog is excited too. Look how excited she is. <laughs> she's super excited. Um, she's so excited. She's shoving all the pillows off the couch. Um, we are going to have the coolest panel of experienced sensitivity readers um, that are going to talk about patterns that they see and and stuff that you can catch and stuff that you can be looking out for and and why you actually need a sensitivity reader how to find one that's competent in in what you need how to tell if the sensitivity reader that you found is competent um and how not to be a jerk to your sensitivity reader honestly um so super excited about that if you are listening to this panel on the recording um if you make one panel this year, July is the one. Come to the July panel, spend the five bucks to come live, uh, bring your questions. Uh, it's it's gonna be great. It's gonna be, do we say lit? We don't say lit. Um, <laughs> it's gonna be lit thick. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I can't stop with the terrible jokes today. Um, I'm, I'm gonna blame it all on Christine. Um, but but for right now what we're talking about is the story that you've been handed and you're reading through it and you're really this is the first time that you get to really start looking at the words of the story 
and how the story is told, not just is the story told, is the story there, is there a story, can there be a story, but but honestly, like, what words are they using? Is this readable? You could have, I mean, like a giant jerk for 10 seconds here and just say that like, as a judge, as an editor, as a writer, um, as a reader, as a reader of a lot of fan fiction, um, I come across stories that I'm like, this is the greatest story and I wish it had been told by anyone else because this person had an absolutely brilliant idea and they didn't do anything good with it after having it. And this is the point where you can save that, right? This is the point where you start to salvage that, where you start to look at, am I telling a story? Is this person telling a story? What's the story they're telling? What voice are they in? How are they telling the story? And how do I make it work for the reader? And the way that you make it work for the reader is very much like you're putting together a meal, right? You're going to go, you're going to take your, your market basket. Let's get this like sort of little red riding hood situation going on. You're going to put on your little cape and you're going to take your market basket and you're going to go out in the woods and you are going to pick all the flowers and take them to grandmother's house or pick all of the greens and you're going to make a salad. Um, and so as we talk about writing techniques, as we talk about uh, the dachshunds that is right ah. behind me, hey buddy, buddy, what? Um, I'm sorry, he's having a really anxious day and I don't know what's going on with him. Um, let's try a treat. Let's see if that works. Um, victory is mine. So that might happen a lot. Um, treats weeds, flowers, um, you're going to notice that I'm going to talk a lot about weeds versus flowers today. And the thing that I want to establish really, really early on is that a weed is a flower that's growing where you don't want it. There's no such thing as an inherent weed. Wow, I'm boring the dog too. That's great. Um, there's no such thing as a useless plant. Even some of the, the terrible, like, you know, like kudzu is edible, I think. Um, there are a lot of really plants that we think of as invasive, as unfortunate. The butterfly bush is an incredibly invasive weed where I am. Um, it's also beautiful, right? Like people, it's invasive because people wanted it and because they put it in their yard. And so at this level, at the line edit level, what you are hoping to do, what you are trying and planning to do is, what you are trying and planning to do is actually get the dog to the dog. Um, but you are hoping to have the right amount of flowers and no weeds. And that doesn't, because flowers and weeds are the same thing, I am making no sense to you, am I? Uh, because flowers and weeds are the same thing. It's all about noticing how much and where these things are in the story. So let's actually dive in and start talking about it because in the abstract, this doesn't make a ton of sense. And um, what you're looking for as a line editor is patterns. So the line edit is less granular than a copy edit. You're not fixing every typo. You're not running spell check, but you are noticing these big patterns in people's writing. Um, and your job is to spot things that authors are consistently missing in their own work and to, to point them out. And these kind of happen at the, at the word level and then at the sentence level. And then I'm going to call the next level, the paragraph level, because that makes sense. Like word, sentence, paragraph, but it's, we're not really talking about paragraph. We're talking more about a couple of paragraphs, a scene, 
a moment in time in your story. Um, and that will make sense when we get there, I promise. So we know as writers a lot about the kinds of words that show up unexpectedly um, in our garden. So you have you have a favorite word. Um, everybody has a favorite word. And you may not know what your favorite word is. You may think that your favorite word is like, I really love liminal. Um, I love the idea of it, chiaroscuro. I love the, the, the interplay of light and dark to make a pattern. Um, none of those is my favorite word where writing is concerned. Where writing is concerned, my favorite word is shrug. My characters just like, there's, there's just a, a lot of, sometimes they shrug with one shoulder, like, oh, sometimes they're like, mm. they shrug all the time. They shrug to talk. Um, I cannot tell you how much of my dialogue is like, blah, 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 Jack shrugged. How, how does that even work? But clearly that's my favorite word. Um, grin is another great one. Um, and the thing is, these are wonderful words. <laughs> I'm not telling you that your characters should never grin or shrug or looking at you, Robert Jordan, smooth their skirts or tug their braids. Like there's a lot of like, if you're doing this, th there's a lot to be had from that. There's a lot of gestural information that you can pack in about the character. Like you notice that I'm talking with my hands a lot. I'm, I, I do, I do this a lot. And so my characters do this a lot. Like I'm going to like get the words out of the air. I'm going to like grab them. Um, your characters probably have a non-trivial number of the physical characteristics of yourself and the people around you, uh, just so you know. And however you describe that is going to creep into your writing and it's going to creep into your writing more than you think. Um, so if you have like a lot of word processors can do indexing now, they can do word frequency counts. And so if you run that indexing, um, function of your word processor, and look at what words you use the most frequently. And if one of them is a verb that isn't like to be, um, start looking at that and, and seeing if there's other ways to, to talk about what you're trying to talk about and other ways to convey it. Um, the other word that you're going to see show up a lot if you do that indexing is things that I'm going to call smarteners. Um, they're not necessarily $5 words. They might be $5 words. Um, if you're not familiar with the phrase $5 word, it is literally just like a long complicated word that, that people are essentially throwing into their writing, like onomatopoeia or, um, praxis can count as a $5 word in some spaces. Um, in others, not so much. It's, it's much more of people's daily vocabulary, but, these are other words that are going to show up. Um, these are words that take up y'all. They take up so much space in your writing. And if you are looking at entering a competition or submitting to an anthology or pitching to a publication that has a tight, tight word count, um, you don't want to use them. And I put a lot of examples in the post, um, this month, but the one that is my current personal pet peeve, because I do read so much fan fiction, I think is such or said like Billy's teacher assigned a bunch of homework. Billy did not want to do such homework. Just say it. We have pronouns. Pronouns exist. You don't have to noun all over the place. It's fine. It not such homework, you know, Janie did not want to get into said car. McKenna did not feel like brushing said hair this morning. It, 
it's, it's, it's a tiny little word and it, it shrinks what you're what you're trying to say but it's it's clear right um the reason the place that this came from such and said is in legal context where you had to be absolutely clear that you meant that hair and not any other hair ever we don't have to be that clear in storytelling we we don't um and it doesn't make you sound smart or fancy or educated it just is a word um the other so not only is it taking up space the other thing that takes up space is all of these sort of throat clearing verbs and throat clearing phrases um oh where's my giant list um Jenny looked sad. Unless you are not telling this from Jenny's point of view or a first person on the ship, Jenny was sad. Jenny was sad. Um, she didn't just look sad. Unless she's like trying to like, oh, I look so sad, but I'm secretly really, really happy that your grandma died. Like, you can, you know, you can use them, obviously, like that's a situation where you would, you would want to use that. That's a flower as far as you're concerned at that point. It's telling people something better about the story um, and more interesting about the story. Um, felt, seemed, started to, you know, Ram started to open the door. Okay. now what um just let the let the action happen don't don't tell us these all of these words put you in a position where you're telling somebody about the story instead of telling them the story and once you start telling someone about the story um they're going to get that additional step of removed right like they're already reading the story now they're reading about the story unless you are william goldman telling the princess bride you're gonna struggle with this um and even goldman is telling when he's telling the princess bride's story you're in the story and then he's telling you sort of the story about the story and you're in that story at no point except in like the little two sentence transitional phrases does he tell you about the story um i'm trying to think what oh so like if you've watched the movie the the situation is if the eel doesn't eat her at this time you know the eel doesn't get her you looked concerned, you know, <laughs> and, and then, you know, oh, where are they? They're, they're in the water. She's screaming, the eel's charging her. And then, and then you're back on the story. Um, so what's, what's the other, oh, redundant phrases is another, and I don't want to spend, like, we've spent 15 minutes on this and it's probably the section that we're all the most familiar with because these are the ones that your teachers helped you pull out, right? Like, oh, you said written five times in this sentence. Maybe don't. Um, so whispered softly or tiptoed stealthily or, or, you know, shouted loudly. All of these adverbs that modify a verb that already says what the adverb is telling you about the verb um you're, you're saying things twice i'm going to start talking even more a little bit later about saying things twice i'm sorry about the disgusting noise it's a dog drinking down here it's it's horrifying i know i'm sorry um we've all been working at home for what like three years now um <laughs> we're used to the dog noises but that one's really egregious um you can use an adverb verb pair I'm, I'm not saying don't again flowers and weeds right if you're going to pair an adverb with a verb the adverb genuinely has to add something to it 
um, kids whisper loudly, Hey, do you know where the teacher is? You know, kids whisper loudly all the time. Um, you can sing loudly or softly. You can run slowly. Um, especially if you want to let someone else beat you. These are all things that, that you can do. Um, if you find yourself with an adverb that doesn't add much to your verb, just, just use the verb. Um, and if you need the verb to more, instead of adding something like just or very or really or suddenly, um, pick a bigger verb. Um, the door fell. The door crashed. The door thundered. These are all things that can happen. Um, and you can see like there's an escalation of verbs. Instead of the door fell, the door fell loudly, the door fell very loudly. I don't know why the door is falling over. It's it's come off its hinges. We've we've yanked it open. Um it's falling away. Maybe it's a trap door. Um the door crashed, the door thundered. These are, these are bigger. The one ring doesn't tinkle to the ground. It doesn't clink. It drops, it thuds, it crashes, it thunks. Um, a, a bell, like if you think about the bell tinkled, the bell chimed, the bell rang, um, it tells you how big the bell is, right? So just, just embiggen your verbs if you can, instead of throwing a bunch of adverbs at them. Uh, the obvious uh, counter to that is we say very a lot in dialogue. Um, we say very, we say suddenly, we say um, a whole bunch of things dialectically that don't necessarily belong in our writing. So if you are giving somebody a voice, maybe they're going to say literally a whole bunch of times. Um, maybe they're going to say a whole bunch of times instead of frequently. Like people, when they're talking clearly, are not always as compact as you would wish they could be. Um, so that's that's kind of our, our word weed section. And I'm sure that you can think of other word weeds. At some point, a teacher has told you to stop doing something um, and put that to heart. And good for you. Just be aware that you can probably put it back in as long as you're mindful about it. Just, just be aware. So if you're, if you're an editor and you're looking at this, um, how do you talk about it? to your client. You say, well, you use a whole lot of adverbs here. I would like to replace these with some active verbs. Um, I don't have a very good sense of how big this bell is. Can, can we talk about this? Oh, okay. The bell chimed. The bell thundered. Um, the bell rang, you know, um, have that conversation with the author or flag it, put it in a comment. We have so many good communication tools now. Um, you can use the suggestions uh, thing in, in uh, Google Docs. You can just leave changes tracked in Word. You should always track changes anyway. Like at this point, as an editor, you should be tracking changes. Do not give an author something that they can't tell what you did to it. Um, there are places, show them where the little like view simple markup versus view all markup thing is. Um, show them how the little thing in the margin, um, I guess it's on that side for you. Uh, have a little thing in the margin shows them that there is a change, um, and they can switch back and forth between simple markup and all markup view. Um, but, but give them a version where they can see what you did to it. Um, and then be very prepared to preface this version with, it's not as big a change as it looks like. Um, I moved a lot of stuff, but the words are really intact. I just needed to move some stuff around in the paragraph to make it flow a little bit better. And, um, if, if you've ever worked with a pro editor, you've heard that. <laughs> um, if you've ever worked with a person who reviews things frequently, you've heard that. Um, it's true though. 
It's it, this isn't just something that that editors are saying to make you feel better. Literally, the changes are not as extensive as they feel when you're looking at them and you open it up and you're like, oh, holy smokes, the whole page is red. Oh, was was there any of my writing saved? Did was anything? Did, did you like anything I did? Um, which is a very, very human reaction to have, honestly. So as an editor, your job is to ease your writer through it. And as a writer, your job is to be open to the idea that your editor isn't your enemy. <laughs> um, they don't hate you. Um, they love you, especially if you're paying them. If you're not paying them and you're, you're doing it in trade, I don't know, look at their comments on your work and see if they actually hate you before you make assumptions. <laughs> um, so, grammar we're moving on to grammar um and the thing about grammar weeds that i think is the hardest for most people to get a handle on is that none of them are wrong very very few of them are wrong comma splices are wrong comma splices will always be wrong but comma splices are a copy editing problem we're not there yet um so what you have then is you have to tell someone this is right, but also it kind of sucks. Like um, ways to say that this is interfering with the flow of your story. This is not achieving the feel that you want. This is um, slowing your story down. This is interfering with your reader's willing suspension of disbelief. Um, these are this isn't getting you anywhere. This isn't adding to your story. You have such a great story and it's getting hidden in all of these things. So these, these are ways that you can explain to a, an author why the thing that is technically right is wrong for their story. Um, which again, I'm throwing you my flowers and weeds metaphor. Use it. Free metaphor, everybody. Um, who doesn't like a free metaphor? I'm giving up on the lemonade. I'm going for the coffee. Okay. So I have an entire packaged rant. Like if you get me a little tipsy at a party and ask me about Grammarly or Hemingway, I will go off for, I don't even know how long. So I'm going to like <laughs> look at my clock here and try to keep it short, but Tools like Grammarly and Hemingway um, are a genuine nightmare. Um, I, I know you think they're not. They are. The number of times I have gotten something um, and edited it and given it back to the author and the author says, I want it the way it was. It's not wrong. I ran it through Hemingway. I'm like, well, Hemingway is a period counter. That's all it does. It counts the number of words between periods. It doesn't, it, it literally, it just kind of relies on you to get everything else right. Um, that doesn't actually tell you if your writing is any good. It doesn't tell you if you're having full ideas in your sentences. It doesn't tell you if you are conveying your story well. It just tells you that you're writing short sentences. Congratulations. See Dick, see Dick run, run Dick run. Hemingway loves it. High score. Um, complicated sentence that actually conveys information and lyrically, Hemingway hates it. Low score. Uh, same thing with Grammarly. Grammarly will correct your grammar to the level of correctness that you understood in grade eight. Um, it may make sure that all of your sentences have a, a subject and an object. Um, it will probably, probably correct homonyms and homophones, um, like there, 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 and which, which is which, um, what it will not do, <laughs> um, is let you have a voice the the greatest disservice that you can do yourself as an author or that you can do to an author as an editor is make everything so correct that the voice of the author vanishes the rules of grammar are there to be broken mindfully 
we don't we talk in sentence fragments we don't always establish you know what something is before we talk about it there now you have two bones get confused um we we're messy humans are messy and the standardized grammar that we use doesn't work um in any language honestly um which is is how you end up with these wonderful you know people playing with language and nouning verbs and verbing nouns and um to google like how much how do you, do you think about that ever did you know that google is just like a noun i'm going to verb this noun and I'm going to verb it so hard that it's now more of a verb than it is a noun. Um, elevator, escalator, um, ebook, e ink. Uh, we just we cram words together, and the, it's beautiful, right? Like we come up with these ways to say things. Um, words that that mean things um we come up one of the one of the most wonderful things in in reading stuff is is when someone has come up with this just intense compact way to describe something and i'm you know i'm gonna pick everybody's least favorite which is cultural appropriation um whatever you think about cultural appropriation it is a phrase that is immediately clear. It says who's doing what, to whom, with what, what's being taken, what's being done to what's being taken. And you might have to unpack, you know, for somebody what is and isn't an example of that, but it is a terribly compact, compact phrase for, for describing a thing. So, um, you can be i would rather and i think most editors and almost all readers would rather that you were less correct with your grammar and a better storyteller you can be an incredibly crap writer and have perfect grammar i if you if your adults in your life kept your eighth grade essay papers I assure you that you can be a pretty crappy writer and also very correct. So don't go look at those. They'll break your heart. Um, but that's the kind of writing that you generate when you work with Grammarly um, or with whatever they're calling Jarvis now, the, the writing AI. It's just terrible. Um, Facebook keeps trying to advertise it to me. So things that are correct that wreck your story are all your sentences structured the same um it's not wrong it's kind of the equivalent of saying um all the time verbing the character verb to noun action they did another action at the same time pausing to think they acted again you have no idea if that was three different things or not because it was the same rhythm um it's a mess don't do it look at don't just look at whether each individual sentence is correct look at whether it's the same as the sentences around it your paragraphs shouldn't all be the same length don't be afraid of a one sentence paragraph don't be afraid of it don't use just one sentence paragraphs don't do it don't I will get the squirt bottle. Um, use them for emphasis. Use them for punctuation. Um, punctuation. Speaking of punctuation, shake it up. I, I don't care. I don't care how much you love your M dash. I don't care. You know what else exists? Parentheses. Semicolon. 
is there, is there somebody who speaks ASL, like tell me the sign for semicolon. That would be great. I would love that. Um, but there, there are so many different types of punctuation, whatever you're trying to do. Um, there's, there's at least two ways to punctuate it. You can have long, complicated sentences with semicolons and parentheses and commas and commas and commas, and they can all be correct. You can have the same sentence and break it down and put a period almost everywhere that you had any other punctuation, and it will still be correct. It's correct. It will have broken the rules of grammar to sound like something. Um, your bonus lesson today, the difference between a hyphen an N dash and an M dash. Back in the day when we had typewriters, there was a hyphen and the hyphen was this long and you hit the hyphen and you use a hyphen to connect words. Use a hyphen to connect words to each other. Um, like I can't think of one that isn't an adverb pair. This is terrible. Um, I am a horrible human being. I literally <laughs> the worst, the worst editor ever. Um, headstrong before it got shoved into one word had had a hyphen. Um, all of the other examples I can think of are like quickly moving, um, and you shouldn't. You actually don't want to use a hyphen with an ly word in most cases. There's an other case where it's like a compound modifier and then you do use the hyphen and if you're confused about this go look it up at the purdue owl the online writing lab um they have all of the fancy hyphen rules and um can explain it much better than me i think grammar girl did a, a thing on it as well um grammar girl and i don't always agree though and i don't like that she doesn't cite her sources necessarily <laughs> i'm like is it though because that sounds real wrong and I, you're not explaining why it's right. Um, so hyphen connects words to words. An N dash connects bigger things. It usually connects numbers um, or is the terminal dash on a sentence, I think, is the other use for the N dash. So if you type someone was pe people from like 16 to 18 year olds can go to this venue. The dash between 16 and 18 is an N dash. It's two of these guys. And in the typewriter days, you would just hit the dash twice and you'd be fine. Um, the M dash is everybody's new favorite dash. And I don't understand why it's everybody's new favorite dash, but whatever, I'm rolling with it. It's cute. Um, it's three hyphens in a row. Um, in AP style, there's a space on either side in Chicago style, which is the superior style. Don't let me catch you using AP. Um, <laughs> there is no dash or no space on, on either side of the M dash and you use an M dash to set off an idea, um, the way that you would use parentheses. You can, when you were going to use like commas a whole bunch like jenny who was coming from new york and celeste who was coming from texas met in chicago jenny's city jenny's hometown um you can you can put a bunch of commas in there but all of a sudden the reader's like whoa this is getting really long but you can also set those off with parentheses or with those m dashes and it's great. It's great. So you have so many disgusting dog sounds, so many, um, so many options for punctuation. Really look at them, look at using them all. Um, they're going to make your writing feel fresher. That's super gross. Babe. Um, the thing, the, the one weed here that I'm going to be adamant about is please, please, I need you to stop putting commas everywhere you would breathe when you're talking. Please don't do that. Please stop doing that. Please, please, please. You need half as many commas as you're using.
you honestly, you probably need a quarter as many commas as you're using because a, another quarter of your commas could be replaced with more exciting punctuation. Um, but, but at most half the commas that you're using. Oh, the dog snuck up and bumped me while I was drinking. Um, you know, leave, leave the commas alone. What's up, buddy? Little cameo from Horatio Hornblower here. What you doing? You gonna hang out? All right. There's a heated dog bed right down there, and so they're all kind of fighting over it is what's going on. Um, this is, this is what happens when I let myself be in the house alone with all of the animals and it's teaching time. Um, so we've gotten through words and we've gotten through sentences. Um, now we're going to get to these sort of structural paragraph level weeds. Um, And again, paragraph level is so it's, it's not a paragraph. It's not, um, it's going to be something that, that creeps back into your writing. Like, oh, you always end a chapter with somebody going to sleep. It is really easy to accidentally always end a chapter with somebody going to sleep. Wow. Is it easy to always end a chapter with somebody going to sleep? Um, and if you've never noticed that, now you're going to notice it in everything you read. And I'm very sorry because uh, it happens a whole lot. Um, but if it's happening in your writing, try to try to figure out another way that the scene ends. Um, people will make assumptions that help you. And so as we're talking about these structural weeds and, and when to pull them, the, the trick is you pull them out when somebody's assumptions are going to do the work for you. So absent other information, and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to treat this as standardized U S American for a moment. If you are a U.S. American writing for a U.S. American audience, you are going to assume absent other information that um, people sleep, people sleep between nine or 10 at night to six ish in the morning. Um, absent other information. If you know that they are a younger person who likes clubbing, you're going to make different assumption assumptions about what their sleeping hours are, but you assume that people sleep every night unless you are told specifically. Otherwise you assume that people they may not necessarily eat a formal breakfast, but you are going to assume that they will break their fast. They're going to have coffee and a bagel. They're going to have a piece of toast. They're going to have a smoothie. You're going to assume that they're going to eat some sort of, of nourishment around midday. Maybe they eat an actual lunch. Maybe they go out to lunch with their people in their office. Uh, maybe they have a granola bar. Uh, maybe they have, you know, a, a bento box. Um, and you're going to assume that they're going to eat another meal after they come home, probably with their family. And unless you, as the author tell your readers otherwise, and this is another a point where like, you need to think of your audience. You need to figure out who is going to be reading your book, what assumptions they're going to be making. And then, and then you can use those assumptions to fill in the blanks. So you don't have to tell people, um, you know, Hitesh got up, Hitesh ate breakfast, Hitesh went to work, Hitesh ate lunch, Hitesh did some more work, Hitesh commuted home, Hitesh ate dinner, Hitesh went to bed. None of these things have to be in your story. You can just tell them about the thing that happened at work that afternoon. Um, there's a, there's a comedy duo called Paul and Storm and, uh, they do a little bit of stand up and a little bit of music and they're very, very geeky. And they have a song 
called George R. R. Martin, Please Write and Write Faster. And George R. R. Martin famously writes, I, if you've missed that Game of Thrones exists, I don't know how you've missed it, even if that's not like your fandom or your fiction or your jam. Um, it's not mine, <laughs> um, frankly, but I, I inescapable, right? Um, it's 900 page monster volumes that come out incredibly slowly. Um, and, uh, and have some things in them that are expected. So, um, the what the song that Paul and Storm sing is one of the the verses is George R. R. Martin, please write and write faster. Please give us boiled leather and sigils and steel. We need our allotment of incest and intrigue and six page descriptions of every last meal. He is infamous for these, these lengthy descriptions of every single meal that the characters eat. And that's another thing. It's like ending a chapter on going to bed. It's really tempting. Um, it's me. I'm tempted. I put too many meals in my work. <laughs> Hi, my name is Rowan and I write about meals. Hi Rowan. Um, they're really convenient. You can tell people a lot of information in a meal. You can tell them about the resources um, that the people are surrounded with. You can tell them about the wealth level, the caste level, of, of the eaters. You can tell them about uh, what their culture is. What are they eating? Are there chopsticks? Is there a fork and spoon? Um, is there a knife? What kind of knife is it? What kind of bread is with the meal? The fact that I said what kind of bread is with the meal tells you I am from a culture that expects to have bread at every meal, not rice at every meal. What kind of rice is with how much rice is this served family style? Is this served individual plates? Is it served buffet style? You can give just like just an incredible amount of information with meals and then all of your characters are in one place and you can make them do things and see things and they can't get away um meals are great um uh, you don't need to describe every last meal for six pages please don't please don't um so um where was i um so yeah, so meals um, are, they're useful. They're a great way to, to bring people together, but, but don't, you don't need to do it all. It doesn't all have to be meals. You can, I, I believe in you, you can get your characters together um, in ways that are not meals. Um, you can, what else? What else gets put in that that takes up space blocking so much blocking this is again this is a really good tool it's a flower for you if you are using it to figure out where your characters are what they're doing if you're the editor take it out figure figure out how much needs to be in there to get across the information and then take out the rest of it instead of using a whole bunch of blocking to establish where things are in the room, consider doing an establishing shot when you come into the room, right? Um, you, it's, it's a very classic role-playing game thing, right? You come into the room and you look around, there's a table on the west wall, there's a, there's a window, the window has these charming little curtains on it, um, there's a sink, there's the, oh, look, you're in the kitchen. Um, and so then you know where everything is. And so when you say, Jamie paced from the sink to the window, you know where Jamie went. You don't have to say, Jamie opened the door. Jamie walked into the kitchen. Jamie closed the door behind her. Jamie walked west. She leaned against the table briefly. Jamie looked to her right. Jamie walked over to the sink. It took three steps for Jamie to get to the sink. So you're, you know, your reader doesn't want to know all that. Once you've established where the sink and the window are, you can just boom, you're in. Um, what else? Oh, um, other things that take up space, your 
repeating things. Um, structurally definitely happening at the paragraph level. And I'm going to read you this horrible paragraph that I wrote. And I apologize in advance for the horrible paragraph that I wrote because um, it's meant to be horrible. Andy hung up the phone in shock. She couldn't believe it. What River had said was impossible. Andy's heart was pounding as she paced the room. Her steps went faster and faster as she tried to slow her heart. When she passed the mirror, all the color had drained from her face at the surprise River had given her. I, that's the same sentence four times. Five times? One, two, three, six times. Um, it's taking up so much room, especially if you're writing for a tight word count competition or you're writing for a tight word count anthology. Um, it is just an impossibly long thing to establish Andy was surprised. And I'm not saying that you should pull all the way back and write Andy was surprised. I'm saying once the reader has the information, stop giving it to them. They're okay. They've got it. They're fine. They're going to be great. Um, so as <laughs> this is one of the, actually the hardest ones to catch as an editor um, is did the writer just tell me this? Do I already know? Um, the other hard one to catch as an editor is especially if you have have point of view shifts or scene shifts is as an editor you're kind of keeping track of oh you know which characters know what you know does uh nadia know what ram knows know what l knows and so if ram is having this scene where he is off doing something and then he runs into nadia and nadia needs this information um a lot of writers will actually just have this dialogue section with ram and nadia where ram tells nadia everything that the reader just read don't do that don't do that because they're going to run into l and then they're going to have to tell l everything again too right like if the reader already knows it, you don't have to say it again, even if the character does. That's when you put in the summary. Rom told Nadia what he had just been through. Maybe, maybe throw in one or two more descriptive sentences and more specific descriptive sentences. Um, but other than that, like, know when your reader has the information. And then as an editor, try to keep that information from being repeated. Um, the establishing shot for the kitchen is also going to take away one of, um, my least favorite tricks, which is hiding the ball. You know, so Jenny walks into the kitchen, she closes the door, she walks over to the table. Oh my God, a dragon. Um, <laughs> you notice that you would notice a dragon. I promise. I promise you would notice a dragon. Um, I mean, maybe not a tiny dragon in the sugar bowl, maybe you, you could, you could hide a dragon, but you need to establish that Jenny didn't see the dragon when she came into the kitchen. If you're going to make a surprise dragon come out later. Um, and then the last thing, the last thing on my list of, of weeds that you want to pull is cliches. And as a fanfic reader, um, I mean, I'm just going to straight up confess. I love cliches. I love tropes. I love if you show me a story and oh my god they were roommates or there was only one bed I'm gonna read it I you know I'm, I'm not actually gonna care how bad it is I'm not getting paid to tell you how bad it is so I'm just gonna read it um but um but I am if I'm reading this story about only one bed and character one gets up and leaves the only one bed without talking to character two and character two woke up and it was all like cuddled and now is trying to figure out what's going on with character one. Does character one suddenly hate them? Um, and then a single tear runs down their cheek. I'm out. I'm out. Story's closed. Um, I get that these kinds of cliches are a very compact way to express big ideas and big emotions. They are cliches because we, as readers, have agreed for years that this is our shortcut way to tell these things. Um, 
The problem is that we as readers have agreed for years that these are a shortcut way to tell these things. And so now it's just like every story you read. And especially if you are trying to get into an anthology or if you are trying to win a competition. And I keep I keep saying this, but it's not it's not as big a deal if you are pitching to a market where you are essentially operating as a unique storyteller. Um, if you are pitching an essay, if you are trying to um, put something together with your friends, it's much less important that you sound unique to begin with. But if you are if you are submitting a story to an anthology, I guarantee you that if you put in a single tier, at least five other people in a group of 10 will have done that. And you can stand out more by actually unpacking this and, and saying the thing that has been distilled down into this compact form than, um, than by using the compact form. I am going to, I think, wrap up there. I am out of things to say. I know that's kind of a surprise for everybody. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to unmute. I am happy to stop recording as well um, if you're not comfortable talking on screen. Just give it a couple of minutes here. during which everyone can listen to my animals. All right.